believe it or not, the first insight humans had into genetics came from the dedicated work of a Catholic friar experimenting on and observing the traits of pea plants. Now considered the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel started with the common knowledge that crossbreeding plants and animals could lead to offspring with different traits. By carefully crossing pea plants with specific traits, Mendel found that the offspring often had predictable ratios of various traits. Working backwards from this, Mendel developed a number of rules that apply to how traits are inherited from parents to offspring. We call these rules Mendel's Laws. Mendelian genetics is the study of Mendel's laws and the probability that different genes will be inherited in the offspring created by two sexually reproducing organisms. While our understanding of genetics has expanded far beyond Mendel into non-Mendelian genetics, we can use Mendel's laws to predict how offspring will inherit many different kinds of traits, simply based on how genes are sorted during meiosis and recombined during the process of fertilization. Mendelian genetics and probability testing using chi-squared analyses will definitely be on the AP test. So stick with us as we cover everything you need to know about Mendelian genetics. In this video, we will cover the concepts from section 5.3 of the AP Biology curriculum. We'll start with a review of Earth's common ancestry and heredity. Then we'll check out Mendel's three laws of inheritance. After the first quiz, we'll see how Punnett squares can be used to predict the outcomes of specific matings. Finally, we'll cover how chi-squared analysis and statistics can be used to determine whether or not observed outcomes support a given hypothesis. If you only need to review one of these sections, feel free to skip forward to the times outlined here. Otherwise, let's get started. Before we can understand Mendel's laws, we have to understand a little bit about genetics and evolution. First off, even though Gregor Mendel was a lowly friar who was born in the 1820s, even he had a basic understanding of heredity. Farmers for thousands of years have understood that offspring have a chance of inheriting the traits of their parents. This is how early humans selectively bred everything from livestock to the crops we survived on. Though Gregor had no idea how these traits were passed on a molecular level, he had a basic foundational knowledge that traits were inherited from parents. This was all that Gregor Mendel needed to know to get started. But there are several other things we need to know that will be incredibly helpful as we start to discuss Mendel's laws and heredity. We now know that genetic information is carried by two molecules, DNA and RNA. DNA carries the information, is transcribed into RNA molecules that can leave the nucleus, and these RNA molecules are translated into proteins via a ribosome. Protein molecules are like cellular machines that create functions within cells, and therefore create the outward traits, called phenotypes, that Mendel was observing. We also know that these ribosomes are found across all domains of life, from the simplest bacterial cells to the more complex multicellular eukaryotes. Not only do all domains of life share this basic foundational mechanism for protein creation, but they also share many other metabolic pathways, such as creating and using carbohydrates, synthesizing phospholipids for cell membranes, and many other core functions. All of these facts suggest a continuity of life from a single, shared common ancestor that likely arose billions of years ago. With all of this in mind, let's take a look at Mendelian genetics and the laws that Mendel uncovered. Think about this. While some traits and conditions are influenced by a large number of genes, some diseases can be caused by a single genetic mutation. These genetic diseases can be detrimental. However, we can also easily predict whether two parents have the potential to pass these genetic diseases onto their children using simple and relatively cheap genetic tests. As we start to look at the probability of inheritance using Mendel's laws, keep these genetic conditions in mind. In starting his pea plant experiments, Mendel understood two basic things about the pea plants he was working with. He understood that pea plants reproduced by producing pollen in the male stamen organs, which traveled to the female stigma organ. Since each pea plant flower has both male and female parts, a single flower can reproduce by itself in a process known as selfing. In order to conduct his experiments, Mendel prevented this process by removing the stamens from one of the plants he wanted to reproduce. Using a paintbrush, 
he carefully transferred pollen from one flower to the other, ensuring that the first flower was pollinated by a plant of his choice. In one of Mendel's most famous and important experiments, he crossed a line of plants that only produced purple flowers with a line of plants that only produced white flowers. When he collected and planted the peas, he found that all of the plants had purple flowers. Though the parental generation had white and purple flowers, the next generation, denoted the F1 generation, consisted of only purple flowers. However, Mendel found that if he crossed two of these F1 plants into a new generation, the F2 generation, at least one-fourth of the plants would have white flowers. This is how Mendel developed his first law, the law of dominance. This law states that some alleles, like the allele that creates purple flowers, can cover up other alleles, like the allele that creates white flowers, in a heterozygous organism that has one of each. However, we have expanded on the law of dominance to include more than just complete dominance. Incomplete dominance is where the heterozygote creates a novel phenotype not seen in either homozygous phenotype. Codominance is seen in traits where the heterozygote shows both homozygous traits at the same time, such as the AB blood type that shows both the A phenotype and the B phenotype. But what about Mendel's second and third laws? The law of segregation states that different alleles are separated into different gametes, allowing for dominant and recessive alleles to be inherited separately. The law of segregation can also be inferred from Mendel's most famous flower color experiment. Since the F2 generation contained some white flowers, but the previous generation didn't, it must be assumed that the alleles for white flowers were hiding in the F1 generation and became separated from the dominant purple flowers before they were inherited. By contrast, the law of independent assortment can only be seen when you look at two different traits at the same time. This law states that different genes are inherited independently from one another. For example, the gene controlling a plant's flower color is not connected to the gene controlling pod color. A plant can inherit purple flowers and yellow pods, white flowers and green pods, or any other combination of these two traits. While Mendel got lucky and chose many traits that were not physically linked, we know now that the law of independent assortment is only true of genes that are located on separate chromosomes. If genes are located on the same chromosome, there is actually a good chance that they will be inherited together. These processes were covered previously in section 5.2 if you need a quick refresher. Now that we have covered the basics of genetics, evolution, and Mendel's laws, let's see if you can apply your knowledge to some quiz questions. Pause the video now and take this short quiz. You can find answers to these questions through the quick test prep link in this video's description. It wasn't until nearly 50 years after Mendel's experiments that another scientist, Reginald Crundell Punnett, devise a way to determine the probability that an offspring would receive a given allele in a mating between two organisms. This tool was the Punnett square. The Punnett square is a simple tool that takes what we know about meiosis and sexual reproduction and puts it in a table to predict the outcome of a genetic cross. When considering one trait, the Punnett square has four squares, a vertical column for each copy of each paternal allele, and a horizontal row for each copy of each maternal allele. Then, you simply distribute the alleles to each box, which represents a potential fertilization event between gametes carrying these alleles. This gives us the genotype and phenotype of each potential offspring. In the case of this trait, flower color and pea plants, there are two alleles. The capital B allele shows complete dominance over the lowercase b allele. So, any squares with a capital B will have the purple phenotype. This includes both the homozygous dominant square and the heterozygous squares. Any squares that have a homozygous recessive, two little b alleles, will be all white. What the Punnett square really shows us is the probability of each genotype and phenotype for different types of crosses. This is a monohybrid cross since both parents are hybrids, or heterozygotes, and we are only looking at a single trait. All monohybrid crosses have the same genotypic ratio. This ratio is always one homozygous dominant to two heterozygotes to one homozygous recessive.
The phenotypic ratio, on the other hand, is only the same if alleles showing complete dominance are involved. In this case, three of four times, the offspring will have the dominant phenotype, while one of four times, the offspring will have the recessive phenotype. This gives us the probability of each phenotype and genotype, regardless of how many individual offspring are created by each cross. Plus, the general idea of a Punnett square can be expanded simply by adding more squares. Let's take a look at a dihybrid cross, a cross between organisms that are heterozygous for two traits showing complete dominance. Just like before, each row and column in this expanded Punnett square shows a potential gamete, and each square is a hypothetical fertilization event between two gametes. This Punnett square can give us the probability of an offspring receiving a specific combination of traits. While anything above a trihybrid cross starts to become too difficult to do by hand, Computers can easily handle the complex calculations, and geneticists can use computerized Punnett squares to predict any number of different traits. Plus, the Punnett square is an easy way to figure out which genes an unknown organism carries through a test cross. Since we always know the genotype of organisms with a recessive phenotype, we can cross a recessive phenotype with a plant that has an unknown genotype. If the offspring show the recessive phenotype, we know that the unknown genotype contained at least one recessive allele. If the offspring only show the dominant phenotype, we know that the unknown genotype was homozygous dominant. Warning, there is math in the next section. Be sure that you fully understand Punnett squares and how they predict probability before proceeding. If you need to take a quick break, stretch and grab a snack, now is a good time. When we come back, We'll see how we can use probability and statistics to analyze how genes are inherited and how they affect different traits. Consider a gene for flower color. We hypothesize that this trait shows complete dominance. Using a Punnett square, we can easily predict a phenotypic ratio of three to one, three dominant phenotypes and one recessive phenotype. So if we were to measure a hundred offspring, we should expect 75 dominant phenotypes and 25 recessive phenotypes. However, due to random chance, we also expect there will be at least some deviation from these perfect Mendelian ratios, since the alleles every gamut gets is like flipping a coin. Let's say that after observing 100 offspring, we find 70 dominant phenotypes and 30 recessive phenotypes. So, how do we know whether or not these deviations support our hypothesis? This is where chi-squared testing becomes useful. Chi-squared testing is a simple statistical technique that can tell us whether or not our observations support a particular hypothesis or expected value. To measure chi-squared, we subtract the expected value from the observed value, square this number, then divide by the expected value for each class. In this case, each class is a phenotype. Then, we add together all of the classes to get the overall chi-squared value. Formally, the formula is read, chi-squared equals the sum of observed values minus expected values squared divided by expected values for each class. So, to calculate the chi-squared value for our particular experiment, we simply need to calculate observed minus expected squared divided by expected for each class, then add them together. When we do so, we find our chi-squared value is 1.33, but what does this number mean? To understand if our chi-squared value supports our hypothesis, we have to compare our chi-squared value to a critical values table. First, we calculate how many degrees of freedom are present in our chi-squared value. The degrees of freedom is simply the number of classes minus one. Since we only had two classes, we only have one degree of freedom. Then, we find where our chi-square value fits in the table. 1.33 fits in the table between the p-values of 0.5 and 0.1. This means that between 50% and 10% of the time, we would expect deviations as large as the deviations we observed. Since most scientists agree that p-values above 5% signal support for a hypothesis, we can accept our observations as support for our hypothesis. Keep in mind that you can test almost any number of classes with a chi-squared analysis.
The AP test will likely have you calculate something more complicated than this, so be sure to take the quiz on the next slide to see if you are up to the task. Now that we have covered Punnett squares and chi-squared tests, let's see if you have picked up the important parts. Pause the video now and take this short quiz. You can find answers to all these questions through the quick test prep link in this video's description. Be sure to check out all the other study resources we have created for this section if you need more practice with Punnett squares or chi-squared analyses. Thanks for watching. Please like this video if you found it helpful and informative. Be sure to leave comments if you still have questions about Mendelian genetics or about how to calculate and test genes using probability analysis. Subscribe to the Biology Dictionary YouTube channel to find more AP Biology videos and study resources. Good luck!